Okay, there we go. Hello everyone, my name is Jen Lovelum. Thank you very much for having me this evening. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about South Africa, photographing wildlife there. Uh, back in 2008-2009, I had the amazing opportunity to spend a year and a half living within the culture, with the wildlife. It, it was a life-changing experience. And since then, I've traveled back five times. Um, next trip, hopefully in 2020 sometime. And I hope to be able to inspire each of you to think about taking a trip there. Um, to kind of show you some of the opportunities that are available at different levels and see where we can go from there. So these are just a few of the topics that we're going to talk about. I'm going to start off with some details of how do you get there, where are some options to go, and then after that, um, we will go into tips with, of photography, um, photos that I've taken over the years, and talk a little bit about that. I've talked with a few of you in the beginning, and I know some of you are expert travelers to Africa. Show of hands, who's been to any country in Africa? Excellent. How about South Africa? Two. Okay, three. Fantastic. Um, the rest of you, we can get it on your bucket list and, and make it happen soon. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, I was talking to Martin beforehand, and when I lived there, I joined the Port Elizabeth Camera Club. And during that year and a half, I gained so much knowledge, and my advancement in my photography skills was amazing by being part of their club there. So what you guys are doing here is fantastic. So let's kind of orient ourselves a little bit with the country. So up in the upper left corner, you can see the whole continent. And we're going to talk specifically about just South Africa, the country of South Africa. When we lived there, we lived in the small town of Port Elizabeth, right on the coast. Um, another big tourist area is Cape Town, but where a lot of the animals are, are up here in the upper northeast corner, Kruger National Park. And that's a lot of the time that we spend, we spend in Kruger. And when we go back, that's the same area that we go back to as well. So some of my basic recommendations when you travel to South Africa. The flight itself, takes quite a long time, 16 plus hours, and that's a direct flight. Um, Atlanta has a great flight, right Atlanta to Johannesburg, um, but I would say minimum two weeks just to make it worth your while. Uh, two international airports, Johannesburg and Cape Town, and if you're taking a significant other or someone else who is not completely into photography and wants to do a little tourist or traveling, Cape Town is an amazing place. They've got the Winelands, and then also, just outside of South Africa, you have Victoria Falls, that is a very touristy area as well. So just some ideas to add to your trip. Now this is a map of Kruger and the Greater Kruger area. So the area in, oops, apologize. The area in the green here is Kruger National Park. The area in the light green is considered part of Greater Kruger National Park. They are private game reserves, but the neat thing about them is that there is an open fence. So all of the animals have access to all of this land back and forth from a national park to a private run lodge or private run game reserve. Um, so you'll get um, some great sightings all over the place. So there are what I consider three different options when you go on safari in South Africa. The first one is doing self-drive. This is what um, we started off doing. We'd rent a car in Johannesburg, drive ourselves to Kruger National Park. Then you stay at the base camps within Kruger National Park. You're in your own car taking yourself throughout the park wherever you want to go. There's a handful of benefits with this. It's the least expensive way to do it. You are also in control of your own destiny. You can stay out as long as you want within the hours. 
You can stay at sightings as long as you want, and you can get yourself into position however you want in your own personal car. Um, the pictures here just kind of give you a picture of some of the different base camps. This is called the Lower Sabi Base Camp, one of our favorites. It's right along the Sabi River. And we would sit on our patio deck here in the afternoons when the sun was really harsh, and we watched all the animals come into the river, all different kinds of sightings right from your own, right from your own deck. Mind you, there's an electrical fence in front of you, so all is good. <laughs> now at night, the baboons would come out and they would maybe be on your porch and deck, but that's another story. <laughs> um, the second one is a picture, just to give you an idea, each base camp is enclosed by an electrical fence, and this kind of shows you the, the one side of it versus the other. Uh, the big difference between driving around Kruger National Park on your own in your own car and, say, the Smoky Mountains National Park, you're not allowed to step outside your car when you're in Kruger National Park for obvious reasons. <laughs> <laughs> so after living there and coming back here and uh, going up to Yellowstone and all these crazy tourists running after the grizzly bears, I like the way it's, I like the way it's done in Africa. <laughs> um, and then this is just a, a, one of the accommodations that are available. It just gives you an idea. It's called a rendezvous. Again, this is your lowest, most economic way to do things, and you're in control of what you're doing there. Now, a few of the cons. Um, you need a longer lens, because you're not able to get as close to the animals as you would be with a, with a guide or a tour. And fewer, um, as far as uh, accommodations like restaurants and the food and that, the choices are not as great as what you would get at a private game reserve. The second option going to a private game reserve. Um, some of you that are familiar may have heard of some of these names. Mala Mala, to my knowledge, is the most expensive, luxurious private reserve in South Africa. It can cost you between $1,000 to $2,000 a day per person. Just to give you the far stretch of the, the, the options that are out there. Um, from what I hear, you get a private guide and a private safari truck to take you out any time you want during that time that you're there, and you should for that amount of money. Um, the one that we enjoy the most is called Sabi Sands. The area that Sabi Sands is has the densest population of leopard of anywhere in South Africa. So we specifically go there for the big cats. Leopard, in particular, lions, and then they have cheetah come through as well. So no matter where you stay, from the end of the luxurious to the most efficient accommodations, you may have visitors in your room. You have to remember, this is Africa. One of the first things that they told us when we moved over there was, Africa is not for sissies. You have to keep this in mind. We're up early one morning before the sun was up getting ready for our morning game drive. I'm in the bathroom, my wife is out getting changed in our main room, and I hear a scream. There's a bush baby in our room. I come running out because I want to see it. <laughs> and she points up, and this is just above where our clothes are hanging. And of course, I run for my camera. And, and she's freaking out, and I'm going to get my camera because I want to get pictures of it. And this little guy was in our room. I think she scared him more than he scared us. But he continued to jump from this location up onto the rafters that were immediately above our head. Now, we had slept there the night before. These guys are nocturnal. Who knows what, <laughs> where this guy was. To say the least, we left that morning and did not stay there again. <laughs> but the funniest part is, we go to the main office to, say, to get someone to knock on the door and say, there's a bush baby in our room. Can you come get someone to remove it from our room? We thought that would be appropriate. She says, oh, did I not forget to tell you? He lives there. <laughs> <laughs> we were in his room. What did you say that the animal was? <clears throat> it's called a bush baby. It's, um, Does that room cost extra? <laughs> that's what I asked. <laughs> a floor show, a ceiling show? All over the place, I know. They're kind of a mix of a, I don't really know what, where they fall into, but they're kind of a monkey because they jump. So I'm talking, he's jumping up over the top of our bed on the rafters all over the place. And I was left in the room to watch him while my wife went and got somebody to get him out. They weren't going to get him out. So we just went on our merry way. So this is an idea just to give you, I do not work for 
any of these companies, I want to purely give you an example of what I have come across in my research. These are the top three are South African photographic safari companies. Um, I found a big difference if you look at the advertisements in the back of Outdoor Photographer and hire an American to take you over there versus hiring a South African company, both in price, um, in knowledge of area. The other thing with the South Africans is that they really care about the conservation. They know the locals. They know where the money is going to go. It is going to help everyone in that area um, down from those who live locally to the conservation of the animals as well. So that's the reason that I kind of just give you some ideas of, of South African companies that you can look at. And this gives you a rough idea of what pricing might look like. Um, we have used Tusk Photo for the last three trips over there and have been so happy with them. Um, you go to a very, very nice game lodge. All of your meals are included. You get a morning game drive, an evening game drive. You have a pro photographer taking you. You have a guide on the front of the vehicle tracking animals, and you have your ranger with you. Um, there's some things you want to think about when you do hire a company to take you. Uh, one of them is your location. Where are you going? And of that game reserve, what is their traversing area? What that means is how much land can they drive their vehicles on? Some of the game reserves are limited to very small. Elephant Plains has a much larger one. But we still ran into trouble. One day we were following a leopard, and we come to this trail. And we stop, and the leopard keeps going. And we're like, why are we not? Well, our property line, or our traversing area, ends here and we could no longer go. So that's a big deal on how big the space they have and what the density of the animals is and the location that you go. The second thing to be aware of is the number, the maximum number of people allowed on a photographic safari with you. Normally, if you go to just a private game reserve, they can pack eight to nine people in three rows on a safari vehicle. That is not very accommodating for photographing. So most of these companies, they max it out at six per vehicle, which means every person gets an end seat and you have a space in the middle for equipment. Uh, another key thing that I love about Tusk Photo is that they have mounted gimbal heads on the side of their vehicle that you can mount your camera on depending on the situation, and you'll see a picture of that later. Um, I don't believe the other three do that, so it just depends on how you like to shoot, if you're freehand or if you want to have that as an option. Um, so again, really do some research when, you're, when you do choose to do something like this. Uh, some of the locations, I think it was this one I was just looking at, and it is more expensive, but they have the option and the rights to go out all day long if they want to. So you're not just limited to three or four hours in the morning, three or four hours at night. You have the potential if you want to go out all day long, um, which, is, which is a nice feature. And then also some of them do an afternoon session of post-processing and development. So this is a very quick, so many people are afraid it's going to be $20,000 to get over there. Now mind you, it can, but you can also do it on an economic scale as well. Um, this just gives you a quick idea if you do two different things on going for a week of safari and then a week of vacation. Just a quick glance at that. Now, every country, in every part of every country in South Af in Africa, there's better times to go than not. So I'm speaking specifically on the country of South Africa. The best time to go is during the winter time. They're in the Southern Hemisphere, so they are on opposite seasons as us. And during the winter, the grasses die down, so you have a much better sight line, and you have the ability to see more animals for a longer time, and less grass 
in the front of the animals as they're sneaking through it or whatnot. Um, cooler temperatures a little bit, but not bad. And then towards the end of winter, around September-ish, it's also the very dry season. So the animals are more in tune to go to the water holes and you will see more activity, um, potentially more kills and, and better opportunity around the water holes. That is where you, the number of animals will be at that time. Um, times you do not want to go, December, January are very hot. It is also the time that South Africans have off on vacation. They take off four to six weeks during that time. Um, things shut down over there. Things are very different over there. Schools shut down, jobs shut down for a couple weeks, and people vacation. So if you want to avoid that, stay away during that time. Um, we tend to go around April, and you still have, a, I like to photograph the animals in greenery still, your green grasses. Um, so we enjoy this time of year. I think this next year we're going to try to hit the later fall though. So again, a lot to take a look at and see what things you schedule, but also it's very important depending on what you expect out of your trip on the time of year that you travel. And then this just talks a little bit more about what I was going into. Um, the other thing, if you're big into birds, the birds over there are migratory. So different times, different months of the year, they will come and go, or if there's particular types of birds like the bee eaters that you want to see, they come and go through different seasons as well. So, big question, <clears throat> what equipment to take? Um, if you are able, I would definitely recommend taking two camera bodies. You always want a backup. If you're on the trip of a lifetime and your main camera goes, you want to have a backup. But also, to have your main camera with your mid-range um, zoom lens, and then also have a second camera body with a little bit more wide angle so you can get environmental shots in is a good idea. Uh, give some suggestions on just a couple lenses. That would be nice to have. And then also the teleconverters are nice to have as an option. The other thing when we were talking about different companies to look at, they have different, different countries as well as different companies have different feelings on flash photography in the wild. The company that we go with teaches you flash photography and it comes in handy on a lot of the lighting situations that you are going up against because you're usually shooting early in the morning when it's still darker and then late in the evening as sun sets and whatnot. So I've learned most of my flash photography shooting wildlife in South Africa. Um, and it really does make a, this way you're able to expose for your sky in the background and still capture the animal with your flash. Depending on what company you go with, you might want to bring yourself a bean bag, the fillable ones, so it's not heavy in your suitcase, and then you get over there, buy a bag of beans or corn or whatever, fill it up, and that is what you will set your cam camera on if you need to have something to steady it. Definitely your memory cards, uh, backup option in the laptop, your extra batteries, and of course remember your electrical adapters and possibly transformers depending on what equipment you're taking. So this gives you, this is the amazing amount that they provide for you uh, from Tusk Photo that you, and usually you don't want your camera on that while you're driving, I'll just warn you that right now. Drives can get pretty crazy. So, what are some just basic starting points? I almost don't even want to put this in there because when you go, I want you to be creative. I want you to try different things. But I put in here just some basics to get started with. Um, things happen very fast. This is the extreme opposite end of <coughs> landscape photography where you take your time, you compose your shot. Things can happen in a split second and you don't want to miss that lion jumping out of the bush going after the Impala. Always be ready. Know your camera. So important to know your camera and how it functions ahead of time before you go over there. Um, other important ones, whenever you're 
your, your wildlife is the, the focus, and you want those eyes as sharp as you can get them. That's where your focus point should be on the animals, is the eyes. Other thoughts you may not have thought about is you want to make sure you have fast enough shutter speed. Again, you're shooting in low light a lot of the time. Um, even if you have to increase your ISO a little bit, you want to make sure you have a fast enough shutter speed so that you don't come home with blurry images. Uh, very important thing to keep. Uh, how many people do back button focusing? Okay. This is very helpful when you're shooting wildlife on the go. So maybe another thought for another lesson if you get a whole group of you that are going to go over to Africa or something like that. But that's a very good, uh, very good skill to have and something to maybe change to. Uh, definitely the high speed continuous shooting also helps out. And then the thing that I do, uh, right as soon as we get in the vehicle and get ready to go, you want to check those camera settings, see where you are, because you could have just completely changed them last night when you were shooting the flash, and then you go start shooting, and your first hour you don't realize what you're doing because you're so excited, and you're chasing a leopard, and it's going up the tree, and then it's making a kill, and you don't have any of those photos anymore. So always check your settings, or, or chimp the back of your camera and just make sure throughout that time frame. Um, the other thing, if you do go with a company that does flash, make sure you get a flash bracket. Um, if your flash is slightly off your camera body, you're not going to get the reflection in the animal's eyes. Unless, if you put it right on the top of your camera, you will get green eye, depending on the animal. Um, so definitely a flash bracket. This is the important thing. Enjoy the moment. Don't be behind the camera all the time. You are in an amazing country with an amazing environment. Take in every sensation that you can get from it. The smells, the early mornings, the cool air that you get um, in the early mornings, the sunset as it goes down, and just enjoy it. So this particular situation gave us that opportunity to take in the surroundings around us. <laughs> We're on an evening safari. And as you can see, there's six of us in the vehicle. We've got our guide, our photographer, and the tracker you can't see in the front. And we come up to this riverbed, dry riverbed at the time. And our guide says we cannot go to the left because there's a female lion with her two-week-old cubs supposedly having her den down there. So we can't go that way. But we saw lion prints going to the right, so we're going to go see if we can track the lion. The lion's to the right, I think it's the males. We take off to the right. Well, it gets a little bit wetter. And we bury ourselves. <clears throat> so we call another vehicle that's with us, and our guide tells us, okay, I want everyone to slowly step out of the vehicle, stay together as a group, and stand here in this open area section right here. So the gentleman behind me here, and myself, who are in the back two rows, we start to climb off the side, and we hear this growl. <laughs> and our guide hears it, and we hear, get in the vehicle! <laughs> this is it. This is how it works. This is what I'm trying to get us out. OK, so we were sitting in the back of this vehicle. In this bush right here is where Mama Lion decided to remove her two-week-old cubs, and that is where her den is now. And we're stuck right there. <laughs> see, I think I have the next picture. So, you can see lion prints right here all through the riverbed because she's right here growling at us. And so we're sitting in her vehicle, waiting for the second vehicle. It tries to pull us out. It cannot pull us out. It almost gets stuck. She grumbles, we hear the babies wake up, they're hungry, we hear them cry. Amazing experience, but a little scary. Um, so finally, it gets dark, and it gets darker. We are in the middle of nowhere. The stars come out, and it's dark. We had called a neighboring farmer who had to bring his tractor over, who had to pull us out. Pitch black with a lion right there. So this is all about experience. We didn't get any photos that night, but boy, was it an experience. So th those are the things to have fun with. So now let's start thinking a little bit more about you are there. Um, a lot of us who do travel photography, we plan our trip, we think about and envision 
some different locations, some different ideas of shots you want to take. <coughs> to a point, you can do that with wildlife as well. You know, do you want back shots? Do you want the sun setting? You know, in your mind, do you want that kill? Do you want to see that? Do you not? <laughs> People have different thoughts on that. So now I'm going to go through kind of some examples of photos I've taken and different purposes for them and different things I had in mind when I was shooting them. So here we're talking about your basics, about your animal portraits. Um, again, I'm shooting at f5.6 so I can blur my background. I've got my bigger lens on, again, so that I'm able to separate the animal from its background and its surrounding. What's, what millimeter lens are you using? Um, most of these is my 100 to 400 Canon L series. Um, that is about what I have on all the time. Once in a while, I'll switch to my wide angle, depending on the situation. I only have one camera body. I'm a minimalist. I am not a technical shooter. I'm an emotional shooter. But I make it happen. Um, and my 100 to 400 is key. It gives me all the flexibility in the world and absolutely love it. So another animal portrait here. Um, this is full frame. Uh, I have a crop sensor camera. I'm shooting with uh, 400 millimeters with crop sensor, but this is full frame. I did not crop this. Uh, this is how close you can potentially get when you have, when you're on a photographic safari. They take you right, right in close. Um, again. From the back of the cheek when you were wet in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> she was a female. I'm glad the male didn't come around her. Um, so. Again, some other things to think about. There are certain times that you will spend a great amount of time, especially with lions. You'll come up on a pride of lions and they'll be laying there and you'll get your safari vehicle kind of right in the middle of them. You'll have babies playing, um, usually a lot of females. The males probably aren't interacting with the females at that time. They're off doing their own thing. Um, but you have time to play and do different things. So think about it close-ups, think about portraits, think about environmental shots. So that's kind of why I'm giving you some examples here. So again, who's your elephant? What are the most defining features of the elephant? The ears, the tusks. Um, get some texture, get some detail in there. Who can name that animal? You can tell by the claws, who knows that? This is a cheetah. Cheetah have semi-retractable claws. Most of the other big cats are fully retractable claws, but cheetah's claws are always, always partially out. And that's how you know what that is. Um, now, also think about things. Say you have a overcast day. Those are the best days. It's the best lighting. You've got gray and dreary clouds. Don't worry about that. You can do so much if you want to go black and white. You can make those details pop. Um, this old guy, I would love to have a conversation with him. He was out, this was on one of our self-drops. This is just the two of us on the back roads in Kruger National Park and we came along him munching on some grass all on his own in the field. And he just turned and kind of just slowly came towards us and he was beautiful. You can see this is at 100 millimeters. So he, he was not too far off from us. <clears throat> Don't forget about the small details. I can't say you can do a lot of macro photography in, in with the wildlife, but don't forget the small stuff. That coin is the size of about a quarter, and he was walking across the road, and I just kind of out my window without opening the door and without getting out. <laughs> my... This is a dung beetle. So anywhere you have elephants, and you have elephant remit, and uh, what elephants get rid of after they eat all that grass. You will have dumb beetles taking care of it for you. They are amazing little creatures to watch. They do their job, I'll tell you what. Okay, so let's move on to a little bit of the greatest things on private photographic safari is your time you're able to spend with those animals. Those vehicles are able to go cross country, so they don't have to, most places, check that out too when you're checking out companies. Most places they can go into the bush wherever they want. What that allows you to do is set yourself up for perfect shots of either the animals walking at you or in position of when the leopard takes the kill up into the tree. This morning in particular, we were out, it was early. We found there's a um, 
group of four male lions that hung out together. And we found three of them. And each one was bedded down in a little bit different area. And our guide just stopped the vehicle. He said, let's just sit and watch this for a while. They're waking up, they're yawning each a little bit in their own spot. He's like, watch this now. One of them gets up, comes over to his brother, and this is the affectionate greeting he gives him in the morning. I mean, just absolutely beautiful for two male lions to capture a moment like that. Again, another animal activity. We get to see them doing stuff. This guy's to give himself a mud bath, both to protect himself from the sun and to cool off. I mean, he sat there and rolled in that mud and just, you know, again, an activity we got to sit there and watch. Um, white rhino are, are very special to see now. It's a shame since we've been there, they used to be all over the place and each year they're going, their numbers are going down and down and down, unfortunately. That's another thing. If this is something you want to do, do it sooner rather than later. Every year we go back, it's so unfortunate to see how things change. So more activity. This is called a lilac breasted roller. This is one of the most beautiful birds. It's so fun to photograph, especially in flight. This one in particular, there's a nest right here that we recognize. And the two birds would go out, get some food, and come back and feed. So this was a goal of mine this one morning, was to get a roller sort of in focus, but with his wings spread. It's not an easy task for those of you that photograph birds. Some more activity. Um, this is a Malachite kingfisher. And this is actually, throughout Kruger National Park, there are various um, hides that you are able to park your car, step into the gated area, and go into a bird hide or animal hide and spend some time in there shooting from the hide, usually over a water hole or something like that. In particular, this one is one of our favorites. And this Malachite kingfisher was fishing right down in front of us. Really nice entertainment for the morning. So the next thing that you come across is when you can really tell a story. We were on a dirt road doing a self-drive in Kruger, just by ourselves. And off in the distance over here, we can hear splashing, and we can hear trumpeting. And so we kind of come up, and we're just kind of hanging out there. And all of a sudden, one by one, these elephants come up this hill and kind of crest the hill. He's a good enough away. ways. We're, we're respectful of his space. He's not going to bother us. Um, and this guy comes up just flapping his ears, having a good old time after he went for a swim, basically. They were down there in the water pool swimming, and then they were just coming out. And they got a couple of different elephants coming up after that. It's fun. So again, the story that this photo tells, this was at a local game park that was 10 minutes from where we lived. We would go there every weekend. They were our animals. And they had a rhino there. This is a two week old rhino. At two weeks old, this little guy was running and frolicking and having a good old time. It's a one lane road that you drive yourself around on and we were first in line to come up to the baby and so we had stopped way up the way because mind you, these feet right here are mama and this is the road that is on. So we're not going anywhere. So we were in front row for an amazing show of this little guy having fun interacting with mom and the other lion that was there. But what was funny, this is a bird and this is what he was, he was frolicking after. He was watching him and chasing the little bird um, and having to capture it there <laughs> in, in the shop. So this is another really strong thing that I try to do. Um, I do the art show circuit around Atlanta, Piedmont Park Art Festival, that type of thing, and I, I sell some of my work. It's such a niche, and everybody connects with certain animals. So my goal when I photograph is to have an emotional connection with that animal, have a, you know, depending on what, you're, what you are photographing. Uh, this guy in particular, we took off one morning again on a self-drive. He is laying in the middle of the road. So this coloring that you see back here, it looks like water or something. This is the road, and he's laying there. We ended up hanging out for half an hour, having to wait for him to move, because there's nowhere else to go. He's in charge. This is, his, this is his domain. But the sun was rising, and the sun was coming up just perfectly on him, and just laying for some beautiful portraits of him. 
So another emotional connection moment. Anytime you can get mom and baby together, you've got, you've got a winner there. So this was uh, when you get into the night and you're shooting with a spotlight. That's where you'll get most of your um, lions. And uh, we came up with Longest Pride, and they were kind of all getting ready to go out for the night and waking up and, and giving each other baths and whatnot. Then you have the special, you have to add a little luck to what you're doing when you're photographing in South Africa. There's a lot of skill involved, but there's a little bit of luck too. And patience, lots and lots of patience. So it's watching animals for a very long time, waiting for them to make something special happen such as this. This one's called Giraffe Love. And then another moment in time. So we're out on an extremely rainy afternoon, and it was one of our best sighting days ever. That's the other thing, when you're out in the rain, the saturation just makes your colors pop, and the animal and the fur or their skin, depending on what you're looking at, is a great time. And again, the, the lightest software versions, your harsh lights, you can shoot all afternoon on certain days like that. And this day in particular, the giraffe were coming across and we kind of stopped. They came across the bush towards the trail and just started going right down the trail. Um, one thing we've really learned is that the animals use the trails. It's the path of least resistance. It's quiet for them. Uh, lions at night, when you go out on night drives, lions will be in the roads a lot as well. So this is where I said the wide angle lens. This is at Addo National Park, which is about an hour outside of Port Elizabeth, close to where we lived. And they are known for their elephants. Herds and herds and herds of elephants. This afternoon in particular, we hung out at this water hole for about three hours. Different group after group after group would come and go to the water hole. And we just got to watch the whole thing from our car, just parked off of here. But at this particular moment, I wanted to capture, to show you their environment, to show them coming in and give you an idea of size and variation and whatnot. So this is where you pull out the wider angle lens. So talking about environment, this is from a bird hiding in. Take a look at, this is called the African Jacana, and take a look at the feet. What does that tell you? He's gonna be walking across the lily pads. That's his environment. And he just happened to be right down in front of us in the bird hiding. He wanted to just pose perfectly for me. So this is one of my favorites of types of activity to photograph, is animal interactions. When you can get multiple species together, it is such a treat to watch their interaction. Um, the leopard was off doing his own thing, and the hyena came in and just started following him. The hyena's kind of thinking in the back of his mind, well, he's going to kill something or he has killed something, so I'm going to follow him to wherever he put it, or I'm going to wait for him to kill something, and then I'm going to take it away from him. That's what hyena do. So we just watched, and, and finally the hyena just kind of backed off and the leopard went on his way and the hyena went on his way. But to capture that moment was pretty neat. This one I call on a ride. I'm not sure there's a whole lot of people who would want to go on the back of a hippo. Certainly not me, but this uh, gray hair felt pretty sick. So this was one of our very special moments that we watched for a long time. It's a very young leopard here that killed an Impala. Again, the nasty hyena came in and stole it from him. We watched this poor guy try and try and try to come and get that kill, and that hyena would not give it up. In the end, the hyena picked up the whole carcass and walked off with it, and that was kind of the end of the show. But I felt so bad for that little leopard who worked so hard to get it and then had it stolen from him. So now let's talk a little bit about light. Lighting is so important. And there's a lot of fun things that you can do. When you go with a professional photographer and the rangers that are driving you with a private safari company, they're going to do their best to put you in position of the best lighting. They're there to help you out. They're there to give you a good experience. Um, so this is just one example of coming up. This guy's taking a nap. Their trunks are so heavy. They will rest them up on the tree to alleviate some of the weight to give them a little bit of a break. So he's just hanging out there resting, and we just happen to be in a perfect position to get some nice backlight there. Again, here I've got 18 millimeter. I pulled out my wide angle lens because we are literally right next to him. 
So, the working with Tusk Photo, we had two vehicles out one night with photographers in it, and each of us had spotlights. So we would take turns, we came across this pride of lions, and we would take turns setting ourselves up where the one group would spotlight to provide us the nice side light or back light, depending on, to give us the rim lighting, and then we would shoot and then we would take turns. So again, when you're going with a group that knows what they're doing, you have much more opportunity to take a dream shot like this. Like, this is one of the photos I've envisioned for a very long time and finally mm -hmm. was able to have some opportunity to work on it. Um, now again, I talk a lot about us doing our own self-drive. These are one of the moments that are exceptionally special when you are on your own. It is just the two of us on the back dirt roads driving. Uh, my wife is driving and I'm scouting. And all of a sudden, in the tall grass, I see a horn going. And all I can see is the horn in the ears. And I keep, I'm like, right, I knew right away where it was. And we watched and followed her. And she turned and came out and turned kind of at us and then went and crossed the road right in front of us. She had very thin, but very long horn for a, a white rhino. And she was huge. Um, I've got some other pictures of her coming across the road, and she took up the entire road as she was coming across. But we, we are the only ones that saw that sight. Those are the amazing things you can do on your own when you're by yourself. Another line of story, we were off early one morning on our own and came across five rhino bedded down together right on the side of the dirt trail. Mind you, we backed up as soon as we saw them to give them their space. Four of the younger ones were protecting a huge old male that was there with them, and he was the ringleader, and the four others were kind of protecting him. And you could tell, we just watched them, and, and then they kind of went off on their own. But those are the amazing, amazing sightings that going out on your own. So back to lighting. Um, this was early one morning, it was very dark, and being able to add some fill flash allowed me to capture the activity of this hyena den, the youngsters playing around, and give me just enough light to, to make that show. So here's what I was talking about when you want to, I don't know how blown out these are looking from back here. These are really blown out compared to what's on my screen, so I apologize for that. Um, it is a beautiful sunset in the background. And I was exposing for the sunset, but again, adding that pop of flash, you're able to get the animal in, in great exposure in the foreground as well. So again, if you don't have good lighting, you have white clouds up in the sky, and you've got a leopard up in a tree, and you have no opportunity but to shoot up at them. Some ideas of what to do with them. Try to go high key, try to do something different, try to be creative in that sense of your photography. And in the opposite situation, go low key. So this is at night with the spotlight. Um, she was awesome. She, again, you can see she's at 220 millimeters, so she was not that far from us. And we were able to position our safari vehicle that she was walking through the bush right at us. And I zoomed in very tight on her with that spotlight and, and was very happy with what the outcome was. Another thing is to play with. This is the palm. Um, they're the best ones to practice your panning on because they'll just go crazy across fields and, and whatnot. So if you've got animals in motion, just work on your panning skills. I probably have a couple hundred photos and maybe one came out sort of sharp. It's not easy. <laughs> practice that before you go. Um, so again, here we were just, we were watching this male lion who was just laying there not doing a whole lot of anything. So you got a lot of time in between. And again, just playing around, being creative, be artistic. Do what you can do with just a twist of your lens as you've taken a, a photo. So here's some I should have worn, sorry, before this one. Um, circle of life. These are high potential of what you're going to see. Our vehicle is actually parked almost directly underneath this leopard. Uh, this particular situation, it was a female leopard, I believe, who made the kill. We did not see the kill but she took the impala up into the tree and she ate on it for a while as we were watching her and then all of a sudden a big male came, chased her out of the tree and he took, out, took after the impala. So there is a survival of the fittest in every sense of the word within species of two leopards going after the same food as well as uh, the poor impala that is no longer. 
Um, have yet to have an opportunity to take the shot of the cheetah chasing down the impala or something like that, but this is about the closest we came. This Pride Alliance stalked twice on this trip. We saw the Pride Alliance stalk the warthog. We didn't see the actual end of the road happen, but we heard it, and then immediately we're on it. This is a pride of 11 lions and one little warthog, and this is what they're doing. This is the ribcage of the warthog, and the, the noises that came from this group, and we're fairly close. There was one time I actually got scared because the whole group, as they're fighting and pulling and tugging, relocated themselves almost onto our tire of our vehicle, and we had to kind of get out of the way because they're just, that's all they think about. And this was at night, so these are headlights of a vehicle that provide us the, the lighting. And this is the same, um, just a little bit closer up with the warthog a little bit further down, but just looking at the different options of different things to capture. Get the sharp eye. This is the story I told about the poor little leopard that the hyena picked up and carried off. This is the end of that story. So this was one of my favorites. Um, this is where I can't thank the driver who was taking us around enough. He did a phenomenal job. These three male lions are walking down the road that we're on. And our driver would continually drive through the bushes. It's dark. It's pitch black out right now. Over trees, in holes, wherever he had to go, circle us around and line us the photographers up where the lions were going to be coming walking right at us. And he did this probably about three times and they just continued to come. So you've got our headlights of another vehicle coming up behind and our spotlight from our vehicle as they're coming towards us. These guys came, I'm sitting in the vehicle in the last seat and they walked right next to the vehicle. I had my 100 to 400 on and had to stop shooting at that point because they were too close. I couldn't get them in range any longer. And to hear their paws in the sand as they walk past you, I'm, I think I held my breath for however long it took them to walk past me. I don't think I took a breath, but that's pretty amazing as well. So here's other, other things too. This is when we were on our own. Um, this is a honey badger, crazy little animals. This is the only one I've ever seen. But we had this little guy walking down the side of the road all to ourselves. He was an amazing sighting, just enough light to be able to capture good photos, but he was really cool. This is a servo in the cat family. Again, a very uncommon sighting in South Africa in the area that we were. Um, different locations, they're more prevalent, but not in the area we were, so he was a, a particularly nice sighting for us. So, just always remember, <laughs> that's the key. When you come back from a week of safari and you have 8,000 photos, just do it. <laughs> and then afterwards. Are there any questions? More of a comment you said, you know, trying to get to South Africa over the next number of years because Northern White Lion is now extinct as it is here. Lions are in decline, giraffes are in decline. Elephants. Lion bones are a hot item right now. White lion, definitely. It, I totally agree with that second best. The white rhino, white. There's the northern, there's the northern white rhino. One of them is now, the male is extinct. There's all females either. Those are the they northern know, white rhino. There are any left. Right. No, so those are like no um, Kenya, Tanzania, northern white rhino. In South Africa, the southern white rhino are still a rhino, they're the best off. The black rhino in South Africa are very scarce. I've never seen one. They're there, but hardly. So definitely go as soon as you can. I apologize if you said this in the address, but either with the tour company or when you're on your own, um, do you have a gun with you? The, all of the guides, the, our guides do, they carry in their vehicle, they have a rifle with them. Um, and there are times that they have gone out tracking on foot. Most of the time they don't take the gun. One time they came back and got it because they scared up some buffalo. Um, they, they do have a gun. When we're out in the car on our own, no, we do not have any guns with us. Um, first and foremost is respect for the animals. We give them distance. 
there's no animal I want to tangle with in a car. They will flip your car over with nothing. Um, so it's always the respect of their space, first of all. That's, that's why you bring along the lens and a teleconverter. You went on your own, your own vehicle on the road. Is there like a market trail you can go? Or you, can... you basically have a map of the whole park, and you can get guidebooks that give you ideas on every different road. What, based on what the terrain is, because Kruger National Park is more than double the size of Yellowstone. It's almost, get this right, it's almost five million acres. I think Yellowstone's 2.2 million acres, if I get my facts right there. So you just go wherever you want to go on the trails. You have to stay on the trails. You can't go off-road, but you just make your own destination. We rented a little Ford EcoSport. Um, now, you and I talked beforehand. You plan most of your shots of where you want to go in the park, or do you just ride? I pick the camps I want to stay at based on that environment in that area and what I think, like Lower Sabi, you'll have more of a tendency for lions. Satara, um, there were sightings of wild dogs. So depending on what I know of in the different areas, that's where we will base our camp and then we'll just go on the roads from there. Um, some of the best time, like we'll go maybe to the bird hides, we'll have a destination to get us to a bird hide or depending on, we just make it up as we go. So I was in, I'm interested in that you are an emotional photographer. <laughs> I had three days in the private reserve of Sabi Sabi, which on uh, the west of Peru. And I was so emotional and so excited that I didn't have a lot of presence of mind to plan and to do this and to that. I was shooting like crazy from two cameras. And uh, what I missed is the emotional connection with the animals. When the lion was looking at me, I couldn't read him. I thought he read me as an extreme. <laughs> <laughs> I was standing up in the vehicle, and my wife pulled me back down. They didn't want me to stand up. They wanted to appear like one big unit. Yeah. So my question is, how many days did you have there? My advice is, don't go only once. <laughs> well, it, it takes, it's over time. Again, I lived there for a year and a half. When, we've gone back five times, and when we go, we do a week of safari, and we do a week of mission work. So we have solid seven days of shooting, and if we can, we do a couple of days on our own first to get out that excitement and those jitters and that feeling. But again, we've been doing this for 10 years now, um, so it is tough. The first time you're out there and you have that experience, it's tough. It, what you want to focus on, what you want to do. That's kind of why I took you through the type of examples I gave you of my photos. It's things to think about ahead of time and kind of prepare yourself for as you are out there in the excitement. Um, Emotional shooter slash passionate shooter, that's what makes my blood, that's when I function best. So everybody's a different type of shooter. Um, but yes, go more than once. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you everyone.